Good morning, Door of Hope family. Over the next four weeks, we want to help you celebrate Christmas with Advent candles. These candles remind us of the approaching birthday of Jesus, the light of the world. According to tradition, each candle has a special meaning. The first one is the candle of hope. People in the Old Testament knew that God had promised to put everything right and send a savior. And we're filled with hope because we know that Jesus was really born on Christmas as the savior God promised. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord hosts of hosts will do this. You ready? Yeah, can you do it? It's good. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this time of year. Thank you so much for being our hope during all this time of uncertainty. Thank you for coming to this world as a baby. Thank you for dying and rising again. Thank you for living in our hearts. Thank you for just uh, the joy and peace that you bring to all of us. Just be with each of us in our church communities today. Just help us to continue to grow and be mindful of, of you during this Christmas season. We love you so much in your name. Amen. 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 Hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well. I'm Sam. Uh, I'm going to be leading us in some worship today. I hope you'll join me. reading Micah 5, 7 through 15. Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which delay not for man, nor wait for the children of man. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through treads down and tears in pieces and there is none to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. And in that day, declares the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots, 
and I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. And I will cut off sorceries from your hand, and you shall have no more tellers of fortunes. And I will cut off your carved images and your pillars from among you, and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. And I will root out your Asherah images from among you and destroy your cities. And in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for its steady, constant truth that we can rely on, for the stark correction and guidance and for hope and that's always pointing to you. Lord, thank you for loving us in our sin and for graciously drawing us to yourself. Thank you for your sacrifice that has made our salvation possible. Thank you for this community of faith, for our leaders. Please bless them with health and wisdom and discernment. Lord, please be a strong presence among us and increase our faith and our reliance on you. Help us cut off and root out the sin in our lives and help us to give our fears and our anxieties to you that we might have courage and hope and peace. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit is in our homes with us today as we worship you and study your word. Lord, please help us to understand your word and to hear what you are telling us. Please move our hearts that we might be more like you. I say these things in your holy name. Amen. Hey, Door Hope Northeast. Ian here. Uh, I'm going to try to help us out as we continue through our study in the book of Micah. Um, we've seen over the last several weeks that uh, what's happening here is, is Micah is announcing a prophecy of judgment over the people. Um, they're living in a consistent and settled sin pattern. They are, they are not repenting. They seem to have no intention of repenting. They have grown comfortable where they're at. And they are in violation of their covenant with the Lord. They're, they're doing everything and anything that is contrary to his will and to his, and to his word. And Micah has, has said, judgment is coming. There's no getting out of it. There is going to be a judgment and a, and a punishment and a captivity that is coming for you. And we see that Nebuchadnezzar does eventually come in with the boys of Babylon. Uh, they take King Zedekiah, they kill his kids right before his eyes, and then they gouge his eyes out, and they put him up in chains and ship him off into captivity. And the people go with him. And Micah is saying, this is coming for certain. There's, there's no getting out of this. This is going to happen. And the Lord uses Micah's pen to say, I am devising a disaster for you from which you cannot remove your necks in, ch in chapter two. And I, I was thinking about that. I was like, you know, it's, I don't think it's any mistake that the imagery of the neck was used because the neck is one of the most vulnerable parts of your body. And if you get into, if you get into a fight and somebody gets themselves wrapped around your neck, it doesn't matter how big and tough and strong you are or, or, or you think you are, uh, someone gets around your neck and it's, it's game over pretty quick. And the Lord is saying, I, I have you by the neck and there's no getting out of this. And at the same time through the book, Micah is prophesying a word of hope and says that there's gonna be a remnant of the people that are gonna be saved. And those that are scattered abroad are gonna be brought back in, they're gonna be made strong, they're gonna be made a nation, they're gonna be the Lord's people. And as, as much as this punishment and captivity feels like the Lord has, has absolutely abandoned his people, he has not. He has not abandoned them. He, he, he will not abandon them and ultimately will, will bring them back into himself. And it's a, an up and down progression um, upward. There's, there's highs and there's lows, but the, the Lord is taking his people in a, in a trajectory of, of restoration and, and salvation, slow as it may be. And Cameron uh, introduced us to this um, in chapter five, the first part of chapter five last week, Cameron talked about the, the, the hope of a future king who, in contrast to the, the previous rulers who were manipulative and taking bribes and cutting the people down, this is a ruler who is going to be the people's peace. 
He's going to lead in the majesty and the strength of the Lord. He's going to build the people up. He's not going to tear them down. He's going to fight alongside them and for them. He's not going to fight against them. And so we're looking, we're, we're, we're looking towards things being good. We're looking towards things being restored and being, and being made well. And it may be way off in the future, but it is there. It's just as sure and, and, and it's just as much of a promise as the captivity and the exile. The, the, the good king is coming. The good things are going to last. And so that brings us to uh, chapter 5, verses 7 through 15 today. And uh, it starts off, uh, verses 7 through 9 start off with some imagery, which is not uncommon. And what's also not uncommon is that uh, with the books that have uh, a lot of prophecy or a lot of poetry and there's a lot of idioms, idioms that are used or a lot of imagery that's used, there isn't always a consensus about what the imagery means or what it's pointing to. Is it, uh, is it one event? Is it one person? Is it a group of people? Is it a series of events? And such is the case with verses 7 through 9. The imagery is used of um, showers on the grass or, or dew uh, that falls in the night on, on the land um, and the imagery of a lion. And there, there's different schools of thoughts, uh, different schools of thought about this. But what is, where there is consensus, and what I will say with confidence is, that the imagery of the dew on the land or, or the showers on the grass is meant to uh, <clears throat> invoke in us this idea of of nourishing and replenishing and refreshment that comes from from the water. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, whenever the, the lists are being written, this is what happens if you obey and this is what happens if you don't. They both, they both use Im images of, of water. The, the, the blessings come down and say, if you obey, uh, then the heavens will open up their treasury and rain will fall on the land. So, so there's food, there's growth, there's an abundance that people are taken care of because the rain is falling. And the opposite is true for those who disobey. The, the disobedience uh, lists on down the line that there actually will be dust that falls from, from the heavens and that their rain will turn to powder and that there'll be a drought. So, so no food, no growth, no abundance, but starvation and death. And the people of the remnant, the people that are, that are, that are saved and are, are amongst the nations, are a people that are to be refreshing. And this again is in contrast to what we've seen earlier in the book where the people were lying awake at night and they were thinking of the evil that they could do and then they would get up in the morning and in broad daylight they would commit those acts of evil and they would steal from the one who walked by trustingly they were mistreating the poor they were taking advantage of the refugees who were in their land and the religious leaders and, and prophets and priests were, were giving a good word of favor and prosperity for the right price it was all about the dollar dollar bills everybody's pockets were getting lined and so they were happy and so it was smoke and mirrors and it was lies and manipulation. And the people of the remnant are to be the opposite of that. They're to be a people that don't cut down and mutilate to eviscerate somebody of all their goods for their own gain, but to be a people who produce to give out, to have an abundance that they can give forth for the betterment of the community around them. And the imagery of the lion. So this, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of crisscross happening here. A lot of different schools of thought. Uh, the the obvious uh, the, the obvious meaning um, is at least and where the consensus does lie between commentators and, and, and theologians is that the image of the lion speaks to the remnant being a people of confidence a people of justice a people who do not walk around in fear regardless of what's happening around them a people who have uh, a surety and assurance and are not easily given or at all given to, um, to, to, to desperation or to fear. And there's people that think that this is reference to the millennial kingdom. Whenever Jesus comes down, eschatology, Jesus is gonna come down and actually rule physically on earth for a thousand years. Other people think that it, it means uh, basically right now, this, this side of history from the cross, uh, where Jesus has, has died and, and been risen and ascended and the Holy Spirit is alive and in in, in present in the church, and that this is that time of, of, of bold, lion-like-ness 
And some people think that it's just a reference to 1948 when Israel became a nation again. And I, I don't, I, I want to mention that, that, you know, those, those are different schools of thought. Those things are out there and, and you can look into them. Um, you can read about uh, this sort of more military conquest in, in Isaiah and in the book of Zechariah. Um, but what I would like to say succinctly is that, well, is the ultimate culmination of history is that the people of the Lord are going to be in eternity with him forever. And so we have reason to be confident. There may have been a time in history when the, the, the Lord fought for the people in a, physical, in a physical battle where there was actually sword and spear and that was the victory to be had. This side of the cross, the battle, the ultimate battle for our souls, the thing that we really need to be saved from, which is from our own sin and the judgment and, and death and eternal banishment into hell that our sin has, has, has accrued for us, that battle has been fought and has been won by the Lord. And so the people of the Lord, the remnant today, are people that can live in confidence because we know that for all of eternity we're going to be in paradise with the King. We're going to be under His Lordship. We're going to be in His, His safe hands forever with each other. That is the inheritance that awaits us. And so whatever ails us here on earth, whatever ups and downs we go through, whatever opposing nations there might be along our borders and walls, this isn't our ultimate home. This isn't, this isn't where we take stock of anything. We're not home. And so we can be a blessing to the people around us. We can have confidence among the nations where we live because our hope is in the true king. Our hope is in the good leader who has, fight, who has fought for us and to whom we will spend eternity. And so now into verses 10 through 14, this is where, I, this is where I'd really like to kick up my feet and stay a while. I was reading through these verses and it dawned on me that um, this, is, this, this struck a very personal chord for me. And I thought, you know, there's there's this story that I wanted to that I want to tell. I wanted to tell this story, and I and I ran it by Cameron and Josh, and I and, and the reason is because I don't, I'm not always 100% comfortable telling personal stories in in this context because it can be anecdotal and, and sometimes not helpful. But um, this story falls in line right over this text so well that uh, I felt that it was it was appropriate to share um, because the, these verses show that the Lord is going to take his people and do a series of, of cutting away of, of different things of theirs. And at first glance, it may not make sense what's, what's really happening, but whenever you take, whenever you, you stop and you look and you read through this, you realize that what he's doing is he's purging the people of inappropriate trust objects or of idols or of false securities. He's taking all of the things that the people will, might put their hope in and he's cutting them off. So they realize that the only thing that they really have hope in is him, is him. And so the people of the Lord are not lion-like because they have military prowess or they've got the, more, the most bullets in their armory or the thickest body armor. All of that stuff gets stripped away in these, in these verses to show the people that what you, what you really, really need and what you should put your confidence in only is the Lord himself. Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The Lord is with us. And so he cuts away all of these things, all these, all these extra things that tempt a human being to not trust the Lord. We think we're okay as long as we have these things, as long as we have our fortresses, our horses, our chariots, as long as we have our, whatever our carved image might be, our ideal our dream home, our dream career, whatever those things might be, those are the, those are the things that the Lord is saying. I, he might cut those things off to reveal to you that all you have is Him. And all of this stuff is, is a false God. It's a false idol. It's a false security. It's all, it's all going to die. It's all going to pass. And to put your trust in that thing is to put your trust into something that's going to die and fail you. And so I want to go back like over 10 years ago and 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 show a story, tell a story about, about how this, this happened to me and how I didn't know the book of Micah back then, but 
the book of Micah would have been so appropriate for, for that time and place. So going back a decade ago, I was, I was 22, I was 23 years old, and some friends and I, we, we lived in Portland, and we all had jobs, and we were all doing well, you know, just doing the normal thing. We were just young, unchurched kids that were doing the unchurched kids thing. We were, we were living wild and reckless in, in, this, in this world. So there was all the drinking, there was all the drugs, there was all that stuff. And over the course of about a year, we decided we, we had gotten a hold of, of um, some email addresses and some phone numbers and we had started making plans for this big trip. We were going to make this trip. We were going to throw off the, the shackles of society. We were going to run away from the capitalist monster. We were going to, you know, we were going to burn our, burn our, our social security card and we were going to just go off into the into nowhere, you know, and just have, have the adventure of a lifetime. We were going to hop on a plane or a train or get into a car and we were going to go off into the, into the great blue yonder and just get lost and just, and just not be in this, you know, this regimented routine of nine to five in a weekend and nine to five in a weekend and get a paycheck and pay the bills. And we were young and dumb and idealistic and had no idea what we were doing, but, but we really believed in this. Like we really believed that we wanted to go out and experience the world at large. We wanted to get out of the places where we had grown up. We wanted to get away from what we were accustomed to and we wanted to get lost. And there was a big world to get lost in. And so we wanted to go live that. Whatever that might be, we wanted to go out and get uncomfortable. So we bought a couple of plane tickets and we were gonna go, we were gonna fly to Ireland, we were gonna live in Ireland for a year. And we were gonna live on a farm, and we were gonna work. Uh, it's part of a program that's called WOOF, maybe you're familiar with it, it's Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. It's, it's, one, it's a deal where you, you go and you work on somebody's farm, and you learn the ways of the land, you learn a new skill set, you help out the farmers, um, and they don't pay you, but they give you a place to live, you can stay with them, and they feed you. And that's the trade-off. You work, you get fed, and that's it. And sometimes there's contracts you gotta fill out, sometimes you can just come and go as you please. And we had one of these in Ireland, and, and we had sent the email, we had made the phone calls, we had reserved our spot, it was there. We were gonna take a road trip from Portland uh, out to the East Coast, and we were gonna take a long, we were making a long road trip. And we were gonna stop and we were gonna see all of these people that we knew on the way. After high school, you know, everybody moved all over the place, and so we had friends all over the country. And we were going to stop and we were going to spend a few weeks with them. And so we were all ready to, we were going to quit our jobs. We were going to go on this road trip. We were going to take as long as we wanted to. And then I think we had a couple of months before we had to get to the East Coast uh, and then stay in Ireland. And I think that we were going to be in Ireland somewhere between eight months and a year. And then after Ireland, we were going to come back, fly back to the United States. And we had a job uh, working for a company in North Carolina who we knew the manager, the hiring manager. And so it was all set. So we have our prediction for the future. We have our comfort and what is to come. We have our, our idols to worship. We have this plan. We have each other. We have our youth. We have the hubris that comes with, <laughs> with youthful ignorance. You know, we, there was nothing that was going to stop us. And then, so as this plan was building, as this idol was, was, was getting uh, mortar and stone and reinforcements and being built up to become... This, this thing that, that we idolized, and certainly I idolized. In the middle of all this, I met a girl in the summer of 2010. It was months before we were supposed to take off, and I, and I fell absolutely in love with her. And I, thought I could, and I thought I could spend the rest of my life with this woman. And she ended up feeling the same way, and so she hopped on board with this plan to be a part of this journey that we were gonna go on, and she, she was all for it, she was all about you know, getting out of town and getting someplace foreign and trying something new, um, getting lost, getting scared, all of that. Anything as long as it wasn't normal. That's something that we used to say a lot. Anything as long as it's not normal. So, Micah chapter 5. I had, I had all, of the, all of the stock that I needed, all of the supplies to be cocky and self-assured and to feel good about the future and about the present. I was, I was 22, I was 23, I was, I was young and I was strong and I had a sound mind and I had money in the bank in case I needed it and we were gonna go, we were gonna go do this thing. And it, I mean, it, I, I really don't know if I can describe enough like how much this, this was like the ideal. This is what it was all about. 
This is what I wanted to do with my life. This was just the beginning. This thing that happened in 2010, as haphazard and irresponsible as it might have been, it was just the beginning. I mean, I wanted to continue to do this for as long as I possibly could. And so in my mind, in my 23-year-old mind, I, I was set. It's like, I, I have everything that I want. It's not much, but it's everything that I want. I've got the plane tickets, I've got the gal, I've got the group of friends, I've got a strong back and I've got a work ethic and we can go and we can, we can make something out of that. We have no idea what it's gonna be, but that's the exciting part. I had a head full of Jack Kerouac and Ken Kesey and Allen Ginsberg. I carried around Dharma bums like it was my Bible. That's a book by Jack Kerouac. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. But I was ready for the rucksack revolution and the time had come. The time had come. We were, we were months away from, from our plane physically taking off and going to Ireland. We, we were here. The time, all the planning, all the preparation. And right before we were supposed to leave for the road trip, like a month and a half before we were supposed to leave for the road trip, um, the, the gal that I was with had, had f for about six weeks, she'd moved back to Nashville, Tennessee, where she was staying. And so I was here alone, getting ready to go on this trip. And, and I got sick. The details of it aren't really important, but I ended up having to have an operation on my throat and I was gonna miss the road trip. And boom, like that, something got cut off. My confidence got a kick in the shin. My hope got a bit of a jab to the third rib. And it hurt, it hurt. I'm not gonna be able to go on the road trip because I've gotta have this operation. But the doctor said, you know, after a few weeks, you're going to be just lay on the couch. You're going to be fine. Just take it easy for a few weeks and take this medicine and don't eat anything but applesauce and ice cream and you're going to be okay. So you'll be able to catch up with your friends later on. So, okay. All right, fine. It's not perfect. It's not ideal, but I can do it. Well, I had a complication with my surgery and I had to have another surgery. I, I was rushed to the hospital at two o'clock in the morning because I was bleeding out from the inside of my throat and I had to go have an emergency surgery and to cauterize everything that was that was bleeding and, and that put me back another several weeks and so now i'm not going to be able to get on the plane when the plane to ireland took off i was literally at home spitting blood into a bucket i was popping dilated pills like they were skittles and i was in a different world and i missed my flight the, my friends actually sent me a picture of them on the plane and there was an empty seat in between them that was my seat. They didn't do it to be mean, but they were saying, we miss you. And it, oh, it broke my heart. And so another thing is cut off. And for the next couple of months, cut off after cut off after cut off happened, I started getting these debilitating panic attacks. This was the most bizarre thing. I had never had anxiety, never had a panic attack my entire life. And I started getting these panic attacks that were so bad and so debilitating that it was like, it's like when you choke on something and your windpipe is completely cut off that panic of this needs to stop right now um except i wasn't choking it was just a it was just a panic about nothing really it was just a panic attack and it scared me and after weeks of of these panic attacks and being on the couch spitting blood into a bucket i i thought maybe the lord is trying to, maybe the lord is trying to get my attention maybe the lord is trying to is trying to stop me and then that was another cutoff and that was another cutoff of my confidence. It was a cutoff of my, of my mental stability. It was a cutoff of how sure I was about everything. Now I'm not sure about anything. I've missed the road trip. I've missed my flight. I've had two surgeries. Because, of, because I couldn't eat, I'd lost like 40 pounds in a month. I was malnourished. I was sick. I was, I was mentally unstable. I was having these debilitating panic attacks. I remember calling my dad one time when he was at work and begging him to not get in his truck to drive home because people that get in cars can get in car accidents and people that get in car accidents can die. And I was so worried about my dad dying in a car accident that I called him at work crying, begging him not to leave. I mean, this was how out of my mind I was. I went from being this young, strong, cocky kid to being completely undone by anxiety and failing health in the course of, of, of like, it was like 34 days or something. This fell apart. And then I started thinking that maybe God is, maybe this is God trying to get my attention. Maybe this is God trying to stop me. I'm getting cut off from everything. Everything that I had worked for is now gone. And then ultimately what happened was the gal that, that I 
was now, I mean, talk about treating somebody like an idol. She was all I had. But I was talking about becoming a Christian. I was talking about maybe God wants me to stay in Portland. Maybe God has a plan for my life that I'm not aware of. Maybe, maybe doing your own thing and building up your own life isn't what it's all about because whatever you build is ultimately going to be destroyed. Like sandcastles on the beach, they're beautiful and then the tide comes in and they're wiped out. That's the human exist. That's the human experience. That's human existence. That's human life. Without the Lord, no matter what you build, no matter how beautiful it is, all that happens is that you die and then it's all for nothing. It's all for nothing. And so I was talking about committing to the Lord and giving my life to Him. And this girl was like, no, dude, no. And she left. And, and that was the last, that was, that was the breaking point. And so I, by, the, by this time I had healed up enough to, I was like, I was on my feet and I was kind of going to work and I was, I, was, I was able to take care of myself to some extent. And I drove her to the airport. She got on a plane and she left. And I was so devastated, I was so heartbroken that I, I was physically having trouble breathing. And I had nowhere to go. I, I, had, I was homeless at the time, which is a whole different part of the story, but I, I didn't have a house. I didn't have a place to stay. I was staying in my car, and, I, and so I had no place to go. And it was like 7 o'clock in the morning on a December morning. It was freezing cold. It was pouring down rain. And I got to my parents' house because I didn't know what else to do. And I was walking up the driveway to my parents' house. They got this steep driveway, and I was walking towards the front door, and my phone beeped. And I looked at it and it was a text from a friend, one of the friends that I was supposed to go to Ireland with. And she said, hey, the text said, hey, I, hey bud, I, I know that this is a really hard time for you and you're going through a lot. I just wanted you to know that I love you. And I, I'm, I'm for you. And I looked at the word love and this was, a, this was a miracle from the Lord. I looked at the word love and it dawned on me that that's what this was. And the verse that came into my mind, which Bible verses did not come into my mind at this time of my life, but the verse that came into my mind like a rocket was, you build your house on the sand. The winds come, the storms come, and the house falls. You build your house on the rock, and the winds will come, and the storms will come, but the house will stay strong because it has a solid foundation. And the Lord spoke to me in that moment and said, kiddo, I know that you've lost pretty much everything that you were banking on. You lost your health. You lost your mental wellness. You lost your girlfriend. You lost your plans. You've lost all of your idols. Everything that you were hoping for in this life, the future that you were going to have, has been taken away from you. And I did that because I love you. And you were building your life up and you thought it was cool, but you were building your life up on the sand. And I have, I have torn that down. I have torn down your strongholds. I have torn down your cities so that we can rebuild a life on the rock that will echo into all of eternity. And I did it because I love you. And there in the December rain in my parents' driveway at 7.09 in the morning, I fell face first onto the pavement and I cried and I cried and I cried because I felt loved. Because I felt like even though everything has been completely ripped away, the good is just beginning. The good is just starting. And life on earth has been okay. But that's not what I'm looking for. That's not what I'm looking towards. I'm looking towards that culmination where there are no more tears, where there is no more sorrow, where there is nothing sad anymore, where Revelation talks about the kingdom of the Lord, the reign of, of the good leader that Christians have to look forward to forever. So as I was reading Micah, I, I, re, I, I, I didn't know Micah back then, but that is exactly what happened. The Lord's fierce love will not allow us to continue to believe in something and to trust in something that is going to fail and is going to die. And so he took everything from me that was going to fail and was going to die. And, and 10 years later, you know, I can tell you it's, I, I don't know what would have happened if I'd gone on that trip. 
I don't know what I don't know where where I would have ended up. I don't know who I would have been. But I would have had faith in a planet that's dying. I would have had faith in a people that are going to all pass away eventually. And that's still true. I live in a house that's going to fall down. I'm I'm married to a beautiful woman who one day is going to die. And I'm going to die. And one day one of us is going to leave the other one alone. The Lord is going to cut that off. But everything that we lose is going to be restored in heaven. And we can trust the Lord to do that restoration. We can trust the Lord that it's going to be good. And so that what what I read from Micah and what I want to share to the people is if you feel cut off, if you feel like the Lord has taken things from you, and this is a time in our history whenever a lot has been taken. There's all these rules about what we can and cannot do for Thanksgiving, whether it's for good reasons or bad reasons. I know there's a lot of infighting there, but there's the rules. People are questioning whether I can have people in my own home. That's a loss. People are getting sick. That's a loss. People are dying. That's a loss. People are losing their businesses and their livelihood. That's a loss. They're losing their hope for the future. That's a loss. That is a cutting off of something. And if you're feeling that cut off, it, it might be a part of a punishment process, like the way that it was for the people of Judah. It might be the Lord testing your faith. That's scriptural. If you're not a believer, it might be the Lord drawing you into himself. Jesus said that no man comes to me unless the Father draws him. The Lord might be drawing you in by revealing to you like he did me that all of these things that you hope for, all of these things that you love, they're all going to die. They're all going to fail anyways, and so I'm going to cut them off now. So that the only option that you have, the only trust object that there's even left for you to, to, to believe in is me. And that will save your soul. And if your soul is saved by Jesus Christ, then the world can do nothing to you. Jesus said it himself. Do not fear the ones who can kill the body but then have no power over you. Fear him who, once he has killed the body, has the power to cast you and your soul into hell. Fear him. We do not want to be God's enemy. And because of our sin, because of our mutiny, because of our rebellion, that is what we are. And the only way to, to get over that precipice is by the blood of Jesus and by putting our faith in him as our Savior. And the book of John tells us that we become children of God. Those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so the Lord is going to cut off all of the things that we believe in falsely. And the reason that we can trust that he is good and the reason that we can trust that this is true is because Jesus, the one in whom we put our faith, was ultimately cut off. On the cross of Calvary, he was cut off from his relationship with the Father, his eternal relationship with the Father. God forsook him. He who knew no sin became sin, and God turned his back on Jesus so that he would never have to turn his back on us. And we put our faith in Jesus, and he gives us the righteousness that isn't ours. We get his righteousness so that God doesn't have to turn his back on us. Seventy years in Babylon was bad. An eternity in hell is worse beyond words. And so the Lord might cut and the Lord might take to reveal to your heart that he loves you and that the only thing that's worth trusting and the only thing that you can trust is him. Friends, we have a great confidence. We can walk around like lions because we have a good king who has gone to the uttermost to save us from ourselves, to save us from our sin. And if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, repent and be saved. You do not want to be God's enemy. Babylon was nothing compared to an eternity in captivity. The Lord loves you. He's calling you to himself. And he might cut a thousand times to get you to realize that. I was brought to nothing. I was literally brought to a hospital bed, spitting blood into a bucket, before I realized that everything in this world passes away. We don't put our trust in strongholds, or in cities, or in fortresses, or in our future, as far as it's concerned with this world. But we can, we can bank on our future in eternity. We can bank on our future when we're in the fulfillment of God's kingdom. So friends, 
I pray that that's an encouragement to you. I know that life can be hard. I know that on this, on this earth, things are taken away and things are cut off. But all of those are just a taste of the ultimate loss that would be had if we didn't have the Lord. And all of the good things that we have, all of the blessings that we have, are just the slightest hint of what eternity in paradise is going to be with Him forever. So that is my word on Micah. I hope to see you all soon. I hope that COVID passes. And if you are feeling cut off, if you are, if you are, or if you are feeling hurt, if you are feeling lost, read these words. Remember this. Remember the Lord. Remember what he's done. Preach to yourself. I hope that this has been an encouragement. And I hope that this band is lifted soon and that we can gather in person again. Until then, this has been a pleasure, and I pray that you all are well. And leave